Lord, good morning. Uh, my name is David Lowe. I appear on behalf of the appellants, who were the defendants below. Uh, my learned friend, Mark Warwick, King's Counsel, appears on behalf of the respondents, who were the claimants below. And if it's convenient, I, I propose to continue using claimant and defendant as it is in, in the judgment, since we will be looking at that judgment a lot. Uh, as a matter of housekeeping, I, I expect the court uh, has a core bundle, a supplemental bundle, and a joint authorities bundle in the normal way. Uh, we discovered there was one missing page from the supplemental bundle, which uh, it, it's a transcript page that was referenced in my skeleton argument, but then somehow uh, didn't make it in. Uh, it's been sent to uh, my friend's side. I propose to hand it up when we get to that point on ground three. That's that, that, that is. Um, I'm not sure any of us has spotted the missing page, so that may show we haven't read the supplemental bundle uh, completely assiduously, but we have generally um, obviously read the skeletons and the judgment and looked extensively at the papers. I'm but there may yet be hope that it won't take as long as two days. I'm grateful, my lord. Well, let's see how we go. I, I wanted to say a very few words about the essential background to the case uh, and then discuss the proposed structure of my submissions. As your lordships and your ladyship will be aware, uh, this case concerns the sale of uh, sale to the claimants of a company formerly owned by the defendants, uh, which was known as Copperman then. It's changed its name. I'll simply refer to it as the company, which was sold pursuant to the amended and restated share purchase agreement of the 8th of October 2018, which I will refer to as the SPA. Uh, by their claim, the claimants alleged that a number of breaches of warranty in that agreement. We'll look at that as necessary as we go. Uh, but there were broadly three types. First, breaches on the basis that what were said to be records of the company were not accurate. And that was a forecast, principally from May 2018, and also two invoice schedules. Uh, we will look at the forecast in due course. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be worth looking at the invoice schedules. Secondly, there were breaches on the basis that there had been a material adverse change in turnover of the company. And third, a breach on the basis that there had been a material adverse change in the prospects, which is obviously where our focus will be uh, today, because that was the only claim that succeeded uh, in some form. We say not the form that was actually pleaded and presented, but in some form below. Uh, and it is against that finding we appeal to the permission of Lord Justice Lewison on, on four grounds. Uh, and I propose to take those grounds in the order that my learned friend has in his skeleton argument. That seems uh, very sensible if I can respectfully say so. So uh, that's flipping ground two and one. So first of all, was the judge wrong in his interpretation of prospects warranty? Uh, second, did the judge act unfairly by finding a breach that nobody had pleaded or argued for? Uh, we say that was unjust by reason of a serious procedural irregularity. Uh, third, and so then coming back to my grounds order, ground three, the judge was wrong to find that the claimants had properly notified their claim for breach of the prospects warranty. Uh, that is in two respects. One is as to quantum, which was the point we argued below. Uh, the other point is as to the version of the claim that the judge found. And I understand my learned friend objects to that because I didn't take that point below, to which when we get there, I will say, well, of course I didn't because I didn't know that's what the judge was going to say. Uh, but we'll get there when we get to ground three. Fourth, that the judge was wrong in his assessment of certain aspects of the revenues from one of the projects, TFL, to be included when assessing the actual value of the company. That's a, a relatively confined factual point, but we say one on which the judge was clearly wrong. Uh, there are two points to make before I uh, get into ground one uh, to set the scene. One is a procedural matter, simply worth noting, as I'm sure the court has that there's no respondent's notice here. So we are simply dealing with, was the judge right for the reasons he gave, or, or was he wrong? Uh, second is a word about relief. And the court may have seen that the relief that we have said we seek is a variation of the judge's order. Uh, it, in, in many ways, in substance, it's, it's setting it aside entirely in relation to the claim that was made against us. The variation relates to our counterclaim, which was undisputed for £787,000 worth of shares that was set off in the event in the judgment because of the finding against us in relation to the prospects warranty. Uh, but obviously, if the that prospects warranty claim 
were now to be found to be unsuccessful, then we say we would be left with our, our counterclaim, whether that's in the form of uh, the shares themselves or in the form of uh, money. Um, that, that obviously, would be a matter for down the line, but just to flag where we're going. Issue one, then, uh, interpretation. First, suggest we look at the clause itself. Uh, second, look at the approach the judge adopted. And, and given the court's helpful indication, we can probably do that rather briefly because you, you will have that. And third, explain why we say that did not reflect the true interpretation of the clause and, and what the judge should have done. So first, let's, if we may, go to that key clause, which is a, in the, one can see it in the uh, judgment itself. That uh, is uh, clause 10.2, and it's a core bundle, tab 5, page 50, to page 43. 43? 43, you say? Oh, sorry, 44, my 44. Name. Apologies. Uh, and it's clause 10.2, except where otherwise specifically provided for in this agreement and without prejudice to the buyer's right to claim on any other basis or to take advantage of any other remedies available to it, if any warranty is breached or proved to be untrue, inaccurate or misleading, the seller shall pay to the buyer on demand certain amounts. Uh, common ground, uh, we say, that the date of this agreement, by way of background, was the 8th of October 2018. Uh, we then want to look at the specific warranty itself next, which is over on 46. You take it from me that the word warranties is defined in clause 1.1 as the warranties and representations given by the sellers pursuant to clause 10 and set out in schedule 4. So this is now the judge setting out what we find in schedule 4. And the one that we're principally concerned with is 19.1.2 under the heading changes since the accounts date. Since the accounts date, there has been no material adverse change in the turnover, financial position or prospects of the company. The account date, uh, we don't need to turn up the reference, but it's defined as uh, 31st of December 2017 in clause 1.1. And if the court wants the reference for its note, that's at core 9, page 162. Perhaps whilst we're here for general context, let's look at warranty 20, financial and other records, 20.1, all financial and other records of the company, quote, records, 20.1.3, do not contain any inaccuracies or discrepancies that obviously featured large at the trial but the claims based on that were successful. We're obviously concerned with the what I might call the prospects limb of 19.1.2 and as a shorthand I'll refer to the prospects warranty but I appreciate it's a part of uh, a, a single warranty that encompasses a number of different uh, aspects but it's only the prospects that matter for these purposes. Uh, and we say just to flag where we're going, we say the prospects warranty uh, should be addressed with the following approach. First of all, you ascertain the prospects, whatever that means, objectively assessed as at the account state of the 31st of December 2017. Secondly, you ascertain the prospects objectively assessed as at the date the warranty was given, i.e., in this case, the first completion date of 12th of October 2018. So that's the, that's the latest date that counts. And then third, you assess whether the company's prospects at the later date were different from the prospects at the earlier date. And then you ask, was that change adverse? And was it materially so? I will come back, if I may, to what precisely is meant by prospect. Not defined. It's not defined in the contract at all. And in fact, it features only in uh, one other place in the contract, the, 
as far as I can recall, doesn't shed any meaning on, on what it means here. So no, it's entirely, entirely undefined. J just for completeness, where else do we find the word? Do, do, do you remember that? Uh, let me see. I, I don't off the top of my head. No. Let me see if I can. <coughs> I mean, I could do the search myself, so perhaps don't worry. It may be a point that I could pick up out of the short adjournment once I've, I've had a chance to do it. It's, um, yes, a good question, but we, we should look at that with uh, So we say that approach that I've just set out is the natural and ordinary meaning of the words of the clause. It is straightforwardly what it means to ask whether there has been a change in a particular matter since a given date. Change is about a difference over time. We also say that is quite clearly established as a matter of authority and somewhat extraordinarily an authority that the judge cited and put in the judgment. So if we go to the judgment itself, paragraph 106, which is core tab 5, page 63, Paragraph 106, uh, the court there cites, if you see just before the quotation, the case of Grupo Hotelero of Vasco and Carey Value Added, decision of Mr. Justice Blair from 2013. Uh, and if I could invite the court to read that citation for itself, please. a clause in a loan agreement concerned with whether there had been a material adverse change in the financial condition of the borrower, but the point of principle, we say, is exactly the same. And Mr Justice Blair says you should normally begin with the financial information at the relevant times, the two <coughs> types of comparisons, and the lender seeking to demonstrate a material adverse change should show an adverse change over the period in question by reference to that information. So the key point for present purposes is the one of approach, One's looking at the relevant matter, here prospect, at the relevant times, and assessing whether there's been a change over that period. So the next broad issue then is what did the judge do? What was the judge's approach? And hopefully I would say we can take this quickly because the court uh, no doubt read the judgment carefully. And we go up simply or, or back, depending on whether you're scrolling or clicking, at one page to paragraph 99 of the judgment. Page 62. And the judge says there, the claimants put this claim on two bases, one being the material adverse changes to turnover, the other being material adverse changes to prospects. And then at 100, the judge sets out his essential methodology. And please can I invite the court to read paragraph 100. We see there that the judge has his own three stages that are different from those that I have just outlined. First of all, he says you identify a baseline figure for the relevant factor, which he describes as the expected or forecast level of the relevant factor at the time of the contract. Second, you determine the actual figure, the actual position at the date of the contract. Third, you consider the difference to see if it's material. And note that the judge uses the word difference. He doesn't use the word change. And 
and that's very significant for reasons that I will come on to. Also note, perhaps, that there is no mention of the account debt in the judge's formulation at all, just the date of the contract. In paragraph 101, the judge continues his explanation of how you arrive at the baseline. The most relevant point is the final three lines, the last sentence there. The baseline is the level which reasonable buyers and sellers, had they been asked to do so, would have agreed to be the most likely estimate of the factor concerns over the period concerned. Of course, he's already said even at the time of the contract. Paragraph 103, if I can invite the court please just to read the first two sentences in that paragraph. Sorry, 103. 103. Judge is saying that if it's an objective matter, that would be common between the two approaches, but it's the words expected and actual. That's what he is contending. Not actual as at two different dates, but expected and actual as at the same time. Can I invite the court now please to go on to page 67? judge introduces what he says is the real question. It's the real question because he's dismissed the records warranty and turnover warranty claims. Then I could invite the court please to read 125 and 126, which relates to what the meaning of prospect is in the judge's judgment, a point that I will come back to, but we should see what he said so it's yes. fresh in the judge's mind. the 
key documents that are referred to in relation to this issue. And those are, uh, we could probably make do with one of the pipeline documents, the, the forecast and the pipeline documents. So the, the first to look at is in the supplemental bundle, tab 30, page 213. sending this through to the claimants as at the 31st of December 2018, saying please find attached a revised draft forecast incorporating some of your comments and for discussion. And then we have the document itself. We have the hard copy at which we can look at for, for present purposes. And this has been referred to by the judges the May forecast. We'll try and use the same terminology. In the, in the top left, I hope that it says in the first, sorry, second black bar forecast PL for FY2018. See at the bottom left, it says EBIT DAR 1628393. Across the top, we have a number of measures of turnover for various months, and the one on which the claims completed case focus is consultancy revenue and my lord and my lady will see there's January to May with A's or A asterisk in the case of May but nothing turns on that, that's actual figures based on management accounts and then June through to December are F for forecast a point of detail to pick up while we're here is if one looks in amongst the administrative expenses towards below the second hole punch. You see there that there's shareholder salaries and national insurance with a total figure of 150,000. If your Lordship's relationship track along the line, that is made up from July of 25,000 per month for those six months, but it doesn't feature in the first six months. Uh, this was a point that got taken into account in relation to the expert evidence and adjustments being made in relation to EBIT DAR on the basis that the 25,000 is for salaries for the two defendants because they were going to stay on with the business and if you're trying to work out what the business might make in the future and assess the past on a basis that is, is realistic uh, in, in any way shape or form for that purpose rather than uh, simply ignoring what they cost to the business on the basis that they would take their money out of the profits and dividends you put it back in on the basis that they would be paid a salary. So if you add in the 150 for those various lines, uh, the 25,000, sorry, for various lines, you'd get another 150. Uh, that would do two things perhaps worth noticing. Uh, first of all, the 1628 becomes around 1.48 or 1.5. 1.5 being the target EBITDA from the contract, the SP. 
FDA. The second thing to note is the EBITDA actual figures for the first few months of the year, last full year. Uh, there's the 114, the 49, the 10622, and the 14215. You would take off the 25 from each of those, uh, and you would end up with figures that are very low for February and, and indeed loss making for March and April. Can we look then, please, at 215? Two one five is is a, is a supporting spreadsheet that sat, as it were, behind that first one, and is the basis upon which the figures were worked out to go in. So it breaks down uh, revenues in relation to each project. In the bottom right of two one five, we will see in am amber colouring TFL and NIDEC, and those start to start revenues coming in from June. Over the page, we see the same thing in relation to BBC and Kerry. BBC is starting in September, and Kerry in the middle is starting in June. The other document to look at is at 217. This is the May pipeline document. I don't propose to go through it in, in great detail because I'm not sure that it matters for present purposes, save to set the scene and show the court what was being looked at. But broadly speaking, you have three <coughs> blocks on there. The first one you will see under type, it says BAU or existing new for most of them. Broadly, as I understand it, BAU is business as usual. Uh, this is work that is highly likely, it's ongoing work with existing clients. So uh, broadly, subject to them pulling out, etc. This is what you would expect you would get under those various uh, mandates with them. Uh, you've then got a second block which is existing new, i.e. existing client but potential new work. And then the third block is new client, new work. And there's a colour coding scheme which was the subject of some argument at, at, at trial. I'm not sure how much it, it matters now, but green, as we said, is broadly high confidence, amber medium, red, low. That's the that's the May pipeline, total figure of 15.2 million in the pipeline, but of course that's not based on particular percentages, that's, that's the total maximum as it were that you might get from those various deals uh, if, if they're realised and if they're realised in, the, in their full amount. There is also a later version of that, a modified version of that document called the July pipeline, Sounds like the learner friend is going to take your lordship to that in due course. I, I don't have any particular points to make about it now. But the where is it? Where, where is it? That's a good question, my lord. It is at supplemental bundle tab thirty-eight, page two three nine. So that's the other page that Mr. Warwick has given us. Yes. We return then, please, to the judgment at four hundred and five, page sixty-eight. That puts some flesh on the bones of the issue as set out at one two seven. Has there been a material adverse change in the prospects, on the basis that the prospect of the four project was not properly reflected in? the May forecast, the May pipeline, or the July pipeline. I mean, just digressing one moment, what I understand that to mean is, um, has there been a material adverse change since the 31st of December in that 
um, you can't take these later documents as representing the true position come 2018. Is, is, is that how it is generally understood? That may be how Mr. Warwick understands this. I mean, we, our, our, the point we always made, my lord, was this that we don't understand how something being reflected or not in a document has anything to do with whether or not the prospects have changed. So one can probably only read it in that kind of way if one is giving it a charitable reading, i.e. what they say is the true position was not represented by that document but was X, and we'll see this when we get to the pleader. Yes. Uh, and based on that, consulting services revenue had dropped as between 2017 and 2018, as predicted as of the 31st of October 2018, and that is the material adverse change that is alleged. So on this theory, yes, you could actually stop after the word company, um, as of the first completion date, since the account state, had there been material adverse change in the prospects of the company. And the rest of it, on this theory, is just explaining why these documents aren't representative of the 2018 position. Yes, but uh, the latter is a are particulars, and we would say it's just a wrong-headed way of looking at this. But um, one can't simply stop at company because you obviously have to identify what is the change that is being alleged. And we say you find that in the pleadings, and they say that because the true position was X, then the difference in consulting services revenue from 2017 and 2018 were different, and that is what is said to represent the material adverse change in the prospect. So you could stop at the word company, but uh, my hesitation in that is that it, it shouldn't be said that the issue is simply at large to do a roaming inquiry as to what the prospects were of the company as at that date. It has to be focused on the pleaded case of the specific material adverse change alleged. This is the issue, issue three of the outline issues for trial. Yes. As agreed between the parties. Yes. But it, the word at the end there is as alleged. It was on that basis that we were. That there was there was some back and forth in relation to this issue. I um, think, yeah. But the, the word "as alleged" is in there, so simply. That's your word. You you, you, I, you I stuck have, those in because it, exactly that's how the claimant was put in the case, even yes. though you didn't accept that that was the way of characterising. Exactly, and we said the reference to these documents doesn't make much sense, but that is in your pleading, and the material adverse change that you've alleged is the one that we will see in the pleading when we come to it. Uh, so, as as alleged, re refers you back. My lord, then on to, my lady, on to one, two, eight. The first sentence shows the judge's methodology again, where he says, I think the way to approach this is to ask what the position would have been if, immediately prior to the first completion date, the claimants had given an accurate account of the decision of the position at that date. We go on to the top of page 69 then. Paragraph 130 in the first sentence. The judge frames it this way I am of the view that if the defendants had given full and frank disclosure of the decision as to the true position and their true opinion of the likely profits, the decision would have required further renegotiation of the purchase price. So, putting it all together, what the judge is saying we need to do is look at what a reasonable person. Asked as at 12th of October 2018, would have thought the prospects were based on the information that went back and forth during the negotiation. And then you compare that with what they would have done based on full and frank disclosure. We can then move on to how that is applied, starting at para 135. The judge deals with BBC, that's at the bottom. 137 is the conclusion there. I'd like the court to read that, please. 137. 137, paragraph 137, top of page 
Where does the phrase high degree of confidence come from? Well, that is in the penultimate line of the no, paragraph. I see it, but where does it come from? Uh, that comes from paragraphs 132 to 134 of the judge's judgment. And specifically, it's in 134, line 4. the judge is saying is that given there had been a drop in turnover in August and September, the question somehow resolves itself into would you then make that back up in the final three months of the year? So what the judge ultimately is doing is looking still at the comparison that we've identified between the reasonable person of the two on the two separate bases as at a contract date. But given the given the drop off in August and September, you'd have to have a high or very high degree of confidence going to come good in the next few months uh, in order to evaluate the prospects in the way that we've done. Is that what he's that's saying? What, that's what the judge is saying. I mean, what, what are the slight oddities? Is This is working out what you expect EBITDA to be in 2018. And you're already three quarters of the way through 2018. I mean, if you're looking to the future, as prospect suggests, you might have thought you would look not at the year three quarters of which has gone, but a future year. My Lord, we entirely agree, because what if, if one takes prospect, whatever that means, the account date, one would be looking forward, no doubt, through 2018, perhaps beyond. If one is then looking at the 12th of October, what, what's past is past, and you should be assessing as at that day, say, well, what can I see in the company? What are the objective factors that I have here? What does that tell me about the chances of success in the future, or if you want to... if depending on what you say prospects means, what the EBITDA will be over any particular period. Quite, quite right, my lord, we entirely agree. It's another reason why this is simply the wrong approach. My lord, so that's BBC. The conclusion on TFL is at the top of page 71, and that's para 142. TFL. The question is as to the nature of the mandate. The position seems to have been that the company had been awarded a £28,750 mandate for a scoping exercise, which was expected will in due course lead to a mandate for substantial work. So there's the, there's the smaller mandate and then there's a, a bigger mandate. And there's an argument about what the claimant's actual knowledge was as to whether the bigger mandate had been won or not, but the, there doesn't seem to be any issue that the smaller mandate had been won and therefore would realise revenue. And we say, in fact, it did in August and September, and, and that's ground four that should have been taken into account. Slightly different figure, but that does rather underline the point. We've covered BBC and TFL. NIDEC is the next one at paragraph 145. The judge says, hypothetical reasonable seller could have concluded that any forecast revenue should be attributed to this contract at all for the year 2018. So back to my Lord Justice Newey's point, exclusively focusing there on 2018. Kerry's then at the bottom of that page, and he says my conclusion is the same as for NIDEC, so zero 
in calendar year 2018. Para 150, Judge comes back to his methodology. submissions were entirely related to actual knowledge and so the point being made was if we assume if the court accepts my case that Mr. Bell knew X, for example Mr. Bell knew that Kerry was not going to bring in any revenue until October at the earliest because he was told it at the meeting on the 2nd of August 2018 for example how does that affect the May forecast and what you can do is you can move forward along the, the columns in, in that document, the revenues for that project, and you see how that affects the, the overall position. The point I simply want to underline at this stage is that relates to actual knowledge. I, I wasn't going into what a reasonable person would have thought based on this, that, or the other, because it was never an issue. Conclusion then is at 155. That based on one of the spreadsheets, the judge has seen a figure close to a million. He says that's not a precise calculation, it's an illustrative estimate. It involves shifting out all of the projects apart from TFL. He put up a finding there of actual knowledge in relation to that. And he says it supports my view that the baseline estimate from which the assessment must start is the expectation. from 156, the judge delves into the actual position and he works from Mr. Diamond's adjusted forecast, which was to take the May forecast but then to strip out the revenues for the four projects on the basis that they weren't going to be realised in 2018, but to put back in some money for TFL October, November, December on the basis that there was a 50% chance that that project would start at that point as assessed at the 12th of October 2018, and to make an adjustment to those last three months, the prospective period, on the basis that if you didn't have <coughs> four projects, you might fill in with some other work. And the figure that you get to from that revised forecast, as you see in the middle of the paragraph, is, is 325897. The judge then compares, in the final calculation, those two figures. So we can see that very clearly if we go on to paragraph 205, which is at page 83. We can see it, we can see it first at 157. If the baseline figure on the effective date, i.e. the date of the contract, for 2018 was 1 million, whilst the actual expected profit for 2018 
I interpolate, was 0.3 million. I think it's clear that constitutes routine and adverse changes in the prospects of the company. And we see it again at 205. This is, this is not, sorry, that's page 83, and this is, this is not to labour the point, uh, because that's clear enough, but it, it's, it's to simply flag that if you unpick this part of the judgment, then his findings in relation to the, the quantum and the calculation, especially the as warranted value, it, it pulls the rug out from under those because it's entirely dependent on plugging in this one million figure to the formula under the contract. Moving on then to the next headline issue under round two. Why do we say the judge was wrong? And your lords probably, and my lady probably already largely have this point. There's two points really. The first is the mechanism adopted by the judge was wrong. It wasn't the mechanism that I outlined earlier. Why is it wrong? Well, it fails to compare like with like at two different dates. Instead, it compares two different things at the same date. And the second point is that it wrongly equates prospects with EBITDA, and indeed in particular EBITDA for 2018. Sorry, just repeat that point again, second point. Second point is it wrongly equates prospects yeah, with, with EBITDA. EBITDA, and indeed EBITDA for 2018. If I can call that first point the mechanism point, for want of a better word, Let's deal with that first. I've already addressed that briefly at the outset. You've characterised it as instead of comparing the same thing at two different dates, it was the different things at the same date. Yeah. So what? Yes, my lord. So what the what we say the judge should have done was look at actual prospects, whatever that means, at date one, actual prospects at date two, or the relevant factors that constitute the prospects, and you work from that to work out what that means in terms of financial value. That doesn't matter so much, but what matters is it's meant to be those those two different dates, and therefore you have two two things that are the same, apples and apples, in the sense that they are a whatever prospect means they are representing the chances of success of the company in the future, or a figure for EBITDA projected from that period forwards, and you're comparing like with like. What the judge has done is to look at two different things reasonable expectation based on what passed back and forth versus reasonable expectation based on full and frank disclosure as at a single date and ignores the account stage altogether. And I said that the word change and difference would be important. Perhaps it's convenient to just pick up the judge's own pithy summary of his own approach in refusing permission to appeal in the core bundle tab 10, page 233. Four lines at the bottom of 236. And the judge says, in any case involving a breach of a prospect warranty, the court logically can do nothing but identify what the prospects were reasonably expected to be by the parties, what they actually turned out to be, and whether the difference between the two is so great as to constitute a breach of that warranty. And he uses the word difference. I said that was significant because the contract clause refers to change. And as I said earlier, change is about a difference over time in the same thing. And can you remove the word difference and plug in the word change to the judge's formulation there? And does it make any sense? No, you can't. change because it's a different metric but he's not using uh, a measurement over time no. as you've already said so his use of the word difference is consistent with his own interpretation quite so my lord but the problem is he <coughs> said the clause refers to change material adverse change and the fact that you can't sensibly use the word change in the judge's formulation is rather telling that he's got it wrong that's the point I'm making about the significance of the word difference as opposed to change. So my lord,
Ford is quite right. That, that accurately reflects what the judge did and thought he was doing and thought the clause meant. But it puts up in light what is wrong. It's indicative of the fact that he's using a single date rather than a comparison over a period. Yes, ma'am. Very ele more elegant way of putting it than I am very grateful. As I've already said, it's impossible on the judge's approach to see what role the account date is playing or why that was referenced in the language of the clause at all. Yes, getting back to the clause. Sorry. I hope I'm not interfering with your flow. But 46 in the judgment. Yes. The phrase, the clause begins with since the account date. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the word since, do you rely on the word since? We, we do, my lord. That's, that's telling us. It's usually a time element. Exactly. You, you would say it reinforces your, the emphasis you put on the word change. Yes, my lord. It, it's putting in very clear terms that this is going to be a comparison between change since that date. What was the position at that date? Where have we got to now? Another way of seeing the problem in what the judge has done is one that my Lord Lucas Newey has already adverted to, which is when the judge does his comparison, he's looking at 2018's performance. And that inevitably involves looking to the past from the first completion dates all the way back to January, rather than simply prospectively. Again, that's wrong. I mean, the judge himself describes it at Judgment 102 as a warranty as to the future. It makes no sense. It's not consistent with his own reading of, 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 or understanding of the purpose of that clause at that point. So we say the judge's approach is clearly wrong as a matter of the language of the clause. We say it's also wrong as a matter of business common sense, which it's trite one can take into account as well when one's interpreting clauses like this. Why do we say that? Well, first of all, we say it injects considerable uncertainty into the mix by making all the information passing between the parties potentially relevant to whether there has been a material adverse change, insofar as it might reasonably inform the buyer's expectations or the seller's expectations, but rather than making the warranties carefully circumscribed in the heavily negotiated and detailed agreement that we have. Indeed, as a matter of fairness, to underscore this same point, we would say, looking at it from the perspective of the sellers, the warrantors, they need to understand with certainty what the warranties are that they're giving based on an objective, natural reading of the words. And to hold otherwise would vastly increase the risk of anyone giving the warranty, not understanding what it means. I, I suppose it might be said, well, if you inject the word prospects into the warranty, you've injected an awful lot of uncertainty anyway. My Lord, that may be true. But there's a question about how much uncertainty, and are you are you pitting it as at that date? And everybody takes their chances, I suppose, of arguing over precisely what that means later. But at least we know we're talking about that date. And I'm not talking if the prospects or turnover, because it's simpler to talk about turnover. If the turnover of the company goes up after that date, and we, let's say it's five million in 2017, you have a brilliant first half of 2018. It goes up to 10 million, and it drops back down to five million again. Are you going to be facing an argument that because they knew it had gone up to 10, you're on the hook for warranting turnover of 10 million because it went down in those last three months? Not, not down below where it was in 2017, just down to the level it was at in 2017. We would say quite clearly that's not intended to be a breach of the warranty. If anything, it's gone up depending on how you model it, but it certainly hasn't gone down, and yet you would be injecting uncertainty upon uncertainty by doing this. This clause doesn't just deal with prospects. It deals with turnover of the financial position. Yes, sir. Again, you, you say, on the, on, on, the ta on the same time perspective since the account date. Yes. It's not, it's not a representation as to what the turnover of the financial position were at the contract date. Well, you would, you, you would have to look at yeah, well, precisely, Lord. You would have to look at the position as at the account state for turnover. What was turnover yeah. then? Compare yeah. it to the first completion date. I appreciate that there may be arguments over precisely how you do that. We had some of that below because, like, are you looking at 
the same part of the year if things are seasonal, you're looking at the long run average and so on. Uh, but broadly speaking, this is the nature of these clauses, there's some uncertainty you can't escape, but broadly speaking, yes, you're looking at the comparison of those metrics at those particular dates. It, it, it's useful to note that there are those different metrics in there because, again, that helps inform to some extent what the other words mean within the same clause. So prospects does not mean turnover. You, yeah. You've dealt with the past through the turnover one, you see. You then have a break and prospects deals in some way with the, the present and or the future. Say the present as a lens onto the future. Can I invite the court please next to look at Core Bundle 10, uh, page 238, which is again the judge's reasons for refusing permission to appeal. It's a passage about halfway down the page that says it starts with Mr. Lowe also raises the point. Could I please invite the court to read that in the middle of 238? This is a point that the judge came up with. I don't, I don't mean that in any way pejoratively, but that the judge came up with in terms of refusing permission to appeal um, in, the or, in the ordinary way, giving further explanation and justification for the reasoning that he had. But in fact, we say that this is a point that counts squarely against the judge's interpretation and in, and in favor of mine. Uh, that is because the judge's approach, in fact, subverts the party's agreed allocation of risk. Can I ask the court please to look at the SPA at Core Tab 9, page 179? Page 179, the lady, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and there should be in the middle of that page clause 10.6 from the SPA. Mm -hmm. And that says, except for matters disclosed, capital D, which means disclosed in the capital D disclosure letter in the way that these things ordinarily work in these sorts of transactions. You have a formal letter saying we make these disclosures and then that plays a particular role under the contracts. This is explaining an aspect of that. Except for matters disclosed, no information of which the buyer, agent, etc., has knowledge, actual, constructive or imputed, or which could have been discovered, whether by investigation by the buyer on its behalf, shall prejudice or prevent any claim or reduce the amount coverable under any claim. There's then 10.7 as a, a counter warranty that, that somewhat and purposely cuts across that, which is the buyer warrants that it has no actual knowledge as at the date of the agreement of any fact, matter or circumstance constituting a breach of warranty save as disclosed, which means that if the buyer does have actual knowledge that will in fact preclude them from bringing a claim under this counter warranty notwithstanding 10.6. But what this is doing is allocating risk in relation to knowledge. And it's saying very clearly, actual knowledge is the standard. And that is why, below, many of the arguments on both sides were focused on actual knowledge. What had been said by the defendants, the Mr. Bell, Mr. Dimstein, claimants, about these four projects. What did they actually know? And it, and it wasn't enough for us to show, well, you should have known this, or a reasonable person would have known that. It was actual knowledge, that, that higher standard. But what the judge's approach does is to say, well, actually, you're only warranting. Potentially, you can, you can reduce the amount that you're warranting, or your exposure under the warranty, or however you want to put it, if you've given information in the meantime that would put a reasonable person from the perspective of the buyer on notice of certain facts. They should have known them. Because 
that's how he assesses the prospect. And in fact, the door should close for the 31st of So how would you, what do you particularly compare that to this paragraph on 238? Where do you say the judge specifically was wrong? <clears throat> well, the judge is saying that this is part and parcel of the, the grain, the scheme of the agreement. He says the agreement also provided that the claimant can make no claim under any warranty in respect of any matter where the relevant facts have been disclosed to him. Well, that's and then right, he says that's, that's, that's wrong. That's a summary of 10.7, 10 is it? Uh, that is the effect of well, clause 10.7. I mean, as my lady says, it's, it's wrong. It's not a summary of 10.7. It's not. That's, that's the problem. Okay. No. It's not. disclosed with a little d, not disclosed with a big mm. d. Precisely. Right. Not, not disclosed with a little d, or, or of course, actual knowledge. No. Yes. That's yes. wrong. So it would be, it would be, and in fact, the way the judge found it was that it had to be disclosed little d, and lead to actual knowledge. So actual okay. knowledge from an extraneous source wouldn't be enough. He said it would have to be actual knowledge acquired from disclosures from uh, the defendant. Right. Which well, is, that's a point, point of nuance, but yes, yes, which I now understand. Mr. Slow. As, as, as no, as my lady says, I'm very grateful. Slow. No, yep. no, 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 no. Are you moving on? I'm moving on. I mean, if so, I, I also wonder really whether this squares with the judgment in the sense if you look at paragraph 100 of the judgment. Uh, page 62. Yes. The judge isn't saying, oh, look, I'm taking a shortcut to take account of knowledge. He's no. saying, this is how a breach of a warranty of this kind should be established. Three stages. The first is to determine the baseline figure, which is the expected or forecast level of the relevant factor at the time of the contract. And that's a different approach. My, my lord, I agree. It doesn't square with that at all. I mean, it, it, it may be, with respect that the, the fact that there were these issues of knowledge in play has in some way led to, led to a model on the on, on the judge's part in relation to how to deal with this because he may have been trying to find a way to use the evidence that he had in a way that comes to what he felt was a, a, the right result overall etc but without finding making adverse findings about who knew what and what they were saying to the court etc but the fact is it's simply the wrong approach yes and to anticipate what you're going to come on to it isn't an approach suggested to him by Mr. Warwick, who had said, if you look at the two dates. Yes, <coughs> exactly. This, this was a rabbit out of the hat in, in the judgment. So my lord, I'm going to come now to the meaning of prospect. We've dealt with mechanism, deal with meaning of prospect. Uh, and I've been to the relevant paragraphs of the judgment. We say the judge effectively equated it with EBITDA, and indeed EBITDA, the 2018. I've dealt with the 2018 point. If you're going to be dealing with EBITDA prospect, whatever that means, you have to look at, at the two dates, not about 2018. Not about 2018 because um, as at the former date, that's probably not long enough for dealing with prospects. It doesn't say how long prospects goes into the future, but it suggests that it's over the longer term. As at the, as at the later date, it's wrong because it looks backwards as well as forwards, but it doesn't look far enough into the future on any view, even if you said it's meant to be a year, or even if you said it's meant to be relatively short term, it's clearly more than two and a half months. Does prospect mean EBITDA? Uh, we say no. Uh, I could take the court to a familiar authority of wooden capita and the point about textualism and contextualism if, if it would assist, the court may be very familiar with that case. You could probably look at it every other week, I, would I imagine. I would be surprised if any member of the court wanted you to take his no. wooden capita. I am grateful. But if, if I can just simply outline the proposition, and I'm sure I will be shouted down in due course if this is heretical. Uh, but when you have a carefully negotiated <coughs> contract uh, between parties who are heavily lawyered up, it, it tends to be the case that the text has particular primacy when one is dealing with an exercise of interpretation there is less scope for context to feed into what the meaning of the words. Obviously, my lord, 
if this point comes up in the judgment, no doubt we'll take that more elegantly from Wooden Capita itself, but that is broadly the proposition of Hurst and Wooden Capita. And we say this case very much falls into the former camp. You've got a very long, lengthy, heavily lawyered agreement on both sides. The words are meant to bear their natural and ordinary meaning that they would have to sophisticated parties dealing with a financial uh, transaction like this. They're unlikely to have been intended and were not intended to be heavily reinterpreted by reference to factual matrix. And indeed, what is the factual matrix relied upon here? It's that the parties talked a lot about EBITDA in assessing the pricing for the contract. And now that's that's true that the parties talked a lot about EBITDA in assessing pricing. But that we say, short of a case where we're once dealing with a private lexicon type situation where the parties, for example, there's evidence that the parties specifically use the words prospects all the time and they use it to mean that particular thing of which there is no evidence. We say that that cannot take matters forward in relation to the prospects. Once one simply has to look at it as anyone would coming at this contract uh, and negotiating it as a, as a commercial deal. It is admissible evidence, isn't it? It, it might depend when exactly they said it. Um, <laughs> it depends. See, if it was simply something that they were saying in their dealings between themselves, uh, such that there was a private lexicon that developed that might be admissible as such. Whereas if you're in the throes of negotiating a contract and someone says, well, when we say prospects here, what we mean is EBITDA, like we've been saying all along, well, you, you couldn't look at that because of Charles and Penn and Simmons and the usual rules on that. But there certainly are cases where one can look at private lexicons as part of the factual matrix. But we're not. no one has ever said we're in that territory. I'm simply drawing that. Uh, and there may be interesting questions in some cases as to where that, where that line is. But uh, thankfully, all of us, that is not this case. So what then does prospects mean to an ordinary man of business? Oh, sorry, to underline that point, these contracts are often off the peg standard term contracts. And you, what, what you battle over is whether you have this warranty or that warranty from practical law or whoever it is, book of, book of terms, which is, again, not admissible whether that is what happened here, but you will find many, many contracts in similar forms. Do they commonly use prospects? I mean, it seems a mad word to use to me. It, it, is, it is a word that is sometimes used, and if one reads commentaries, and I, I couldn't cite any particular commentary uh, to my lord on this, but from a while ago when I was looking at this, I couldn't find any guidance as to what it means, apart from the fact that in, in some way it's going to be talking about the future. Uh, and indeed, I recall that in one of the commentaries it did say it's a mad thing to put in because <laughs> it's totally unclear what it means from either side. In fact, one commentary I read suggested that it might be sensible to put it in because it's mad, because it might mean the party's settled because no one knows where they're going to end up. But I, I wouldn't <laughs> want to suggest that as a good basis for drafting contracts. But these things are done through horse trading sometimes, no doubt, late at night and with no one focusing on the fact they're going to potentially end up in court in five years' time. So. One would have thought that the ordinary man of business, if he included a term like prospects, would insist that it was defined. But there we go. Milady, that would probably be sensible <laughs> for anyone dealing with these contracts in the future. Sadly, we are where we are. The first point I would make about meaning of, EBITDA, of prospects and that it's not simply EBITDA is if the parties had meant EBITDA, they would have said EBITDA. All the more so if they've been talking about it a lot. Uh, but we can take that point perhaps better from the contract itself because the contract itself does have references to EBITDA in. It has references to EBITDA in, in the pricing mechanism. Uh, one can see that, for instance, at Core 9, page 171. Bottom of the page. reasonably complicated variable pricing mechanism that I'm not sure it's necessary for me to go through with the courts, but, but in, in essence, you get five million guaranteed in cash. You get 787,000 guaranteed in shares, but above that, what you get is dependent upon EBITDA, specifically EBITDA for 2018 and 2019. Some aspects it's 2018 alone, some aspects it's an average of 2018 and 2019. So 4.5 we see at the bottom of that page. Uh, we'd have to make an EBITDA statement. And if it's equal to or more than 100% of the target EBITDA, 1.5 million, 
million, uh, then you get the money out of the retention account, which is about 1.75 million uh, in relation to the first tranche of shares. I'm not sure it's necessary to go through the mechanism in detail because my point is simply EBITDA is used in the contract when the parties mean EBITDA. So we should be looking, we say, something else. Another reason, which perhaps ties into the lady's point, is, is this definition point. If you'd meant EBITDA, no doubt you would have said, and we mean it over this particular period. Or you might even have put a figure in. Uh, but there's nothing like that, which again we say strongly suggests that it was not the intended meaning. That said, they didn't bother to put in a period for turnover or financial position. Well, that's, that's true. I suppose financial position could be a is probably a point in time. Turnover probably does give rise to some of the same issues as I alluded to before, but not on the same scale, perhaps, because one's either looking at a direct comparator, probably from the year before or equivalent months, or a long-run average of turnover. But yes, there would be uncertainty in relation to that as well. But in relation to turnover, of course, the point is we're not dealing with trying to work out what the parties must have meant in the same way, because everyone knows what turnover means. They specify that financial metric. So that's it. It means that financial metric because they said it. Uh, with prospects, there's rather more to play for. Third, we say it's inherently unlikely that the parties intended to warrant any particular level of EBITDA, particularly when there was a pricing mechanism based on EBITDA that was going to take them into account. And so we say for all those reasons the court was wrong with respect to equate prospects with future EBITDA. Now the claimant's pleaded case was that prospects means the future financial performance brackets or forecasts, close brackets, of the company. That's clear because we claim paragraph 11. We don't need to turn it up now. But taking that in turn, because obviously a task for this court will be, what does this clause really mean? As to forecasts, we say again, as, as with EBITDA, that's what the parties have meant. No doubt they would have said it. And, and it, it's a totally different thing. And it doesn't make any sense anyway, because you may or may not have a forecast. And again, forecast at what date. But if, if you don't have one, how could you be warranting it? As for future financial performance, we say that leads to a lot of the same problems as EBITDA. Over, it's rather too specific. Over, over what time frame? Measured by what metric? It also, and this is perhaps the critical point, it doesn't factor in what is, we would say, inherent in the word prospects, which is that it's to do with chances. It's not about any particular one outcome being achieved. It is about chances of success in the future. So we say what one should be looking at is present matters, at the relevant date, not a subjective prediction. These are present factors to do with the, the fundamentals of the business that go to its chances of being successful in the future. Or to put it another way, things that go to the company's ability to succeed in the market, rather than looking to the market so much. Why do you say that market fa extraneous factors like the market aren't relevant to assessing prospects? Well, my lord, it, it's simply a question of whether one expects that that is something that the parties ought reasonably be taken to have warranted without having made it clear. But think of the kind of things that that could take in. We, we're talking about things like COVID, natural disasters, wars, etc., etc. Now, those sorts of things might be commonly known, might be dealt with by actual knowledge. They might not. Um, but looking at the market, looking at things like demand, etc., we would say that in this type of transaction really properly should be something for the due diligence to be being done by the buyer. That's part of So the some extraneous matters may be relevant, but not, uh, not others. Yes. But how do you get that from the word prospects? I mean, <laughs> prospects on Facebook means how do things look for the future? Um, so suppose you're a widget manufacturer. At one date, there's enormous demand for widgets. At the next date, widgets have been banned. Um, uh, is that not relevant to the company's prospects? Lord, I, I, well, 
one can see that one could interpret prospect that way in, in, a, in a wider sense. Yes, it is. And it's simply about what risk was being allocated in relation to that. Uh, and we say it's rather more likely. Another way of looking at it is company-specific factors rather than market factors. Rather more likely that the risk that the buyers ought to be taken to have taken on by warranting the prospect are things that relate to their own specific company rather than things that anyone can see by looking at the market in which they are both thoroughly involved. It, it's sort of a, it's a matter of, I can't take it from the word itself. One has to take it simply from what one would reasonably expect parties to be doing. But, it, but it's sort of a, a scope of the duty type point. Are you really taking on all of the risk of the, of the market crashing in some way, shape, or form? Or is this something meant to be rather more focused on the company? And it, it seems, with respect, a pretty onerous burden to be putting that without making it clear that it includes. I mean, the extraneous factors will be constant in, in a sense. The, they may be known or unknown. The, the factors which make a material difference to the, pro, to the prospects are the internal ones. That's what you're saying. That's what we would say. And you're also uh, arriving at that conclusion because you're saying um, uh, reasonable parties of the kind uh, that these parties were, who were involved in this market, would therefore have all that market information in any event and would focus on the particular um, aspects of this company. Yes, I mean, one, one can imagine a scenario, and it might be said, how is this COVID or earthquake example going to make, make any difference? But one, one could imagine a situation where, for example, the first completion date is the, as here, the 8th of October, uh, but the warranties are given as at the 12th of October committed to be bound at the 8th, but you're giving warranties up to the 12th. If something calamitous in the world happens, whatever that, whatever that may be, were you really taking on that risk by warranting the prospects of this business, or is, are those market factors that are, are caveat emptor? So, or you're probably coming on to this, but how, what inquiries would you have undertaken to establish whether there had been a breach of the prospect warranty? What would you have looked to? Well, Lord, it depends on what one is saying as a matter of fact has changed. So an example would be um, that the defendants were, they agreed that they were going to stay on in this business, and that was part of the value that was being bought. You, you bought their expertise, their relationships, and so on. Um, if they left, Oh, sorry, not if they left the business, because that, that would be contrary to contract, but if, if one of them had a serious medical issue that then meant they were going to be unable to perform that role, or that they both did, or if it was a, a team move where you lost all of your IT people doing all of the, the SAP work, or SAP turned around and told you that they were never going to give you any business leads again, SAP's the company that produces this software. All of those are things that you could well imagine might affect how the company would do in the future, its chances of being successful in the future. And what you would have to do is say, well, what difference does that make? What, how was that? How did that factor look as at the account state? My, my relationship is sad, but rather rosy at the account state. Mr. Mr. Garbutt was in fine health at the account state, whatever it may be. Uh, and, and apologies to Mr. Garbutt if that's an example. But it, then you would look at the the date on the what on which the warranty is given, and, and you would compare the same thing. You would say, well, how, what what impact is this going to have on the company going forward? And I, I appreciate that might lead through a process of a reduction to having to put figures on things. Although, given that this is about chances, I expect it wouldn't come to a single figure because you're not warranting a single figure. It, it might come to a range or a profile or something like that. But it would be tethered to the particular thing that you say has changed in relation to relevant factors that would affect future performance. And I, I haven't focused on the ingredients of the business as usual part of the pipeline. Um, but suppose at the end of 2017, there had been a business as usual customer generating um, half a million a month. 
Uh, and then by October, that customer had said, we're not sending you any more work. Um, would that not have been relevant to the prospects? My Lord, we would have to accept that that could be relevant to the prospects. But uh, it is also worth noting on that front that there is a, there is a specific warranty in fact in relation to material counterparties. So uh, the warranties are all separate. That doesn't stop you looking at one to inform the meaning of the other. As it, it's possible that that is carved out by the fact you have a specific warranty about material counterparties. So it would be subject to that point. Does the court think that it is that is carved out because it's sufficiently dealt with elsewhere? The reference for that is at core nine, page two hundred two. <coughs> there's a list of at the bottom of two hundred two material current counterparties who are BAE Systems Alliance. Green Core Group, Henderson, Lloyd's Register, and Trinity Mirror, and then there's a further list of material non current counterparties who are Bank of Ireland, Yorkshire Water, Segro, and then the warranty given at 11.2 is in the last 18 months, no material current party has ceased or threatened to cease to do business with the company. So that specific scenario more, is, is dealt with. And in fact, on reflection, our primary case would be that is, that is carved out. If it is, if it's not, so it would have to be on a business basis and um, somebody other than a material current counterparty. It would, which may affect materiality, uh, but whether whether in principle that could go to prospects. I suppose. Imagine the pipeline. What? How much work does it look like we have over the longer term coming up? And the work pipeline got on different points. If take an extreme example, if you have. Nobody looking at coming through your door in the next 12 months. That seems to be a, a relevant factor going to your prospects for the future. But then I don't see how that is different in principle from saying your relationship with someone that gives you lots of strong leads has fallen off a cliff. And perhaps in relation to um, a, a major customer uh, ceasing. Their relationship with you, that you say is covered by a separate warranty. But if it's in, uh, if it's a matter uh, which then um, leads to a diminution in your status in that particular area of the market, then that is prospects. Uh, yes, my lord, that, that might. I mean, it may be, it may be difficult on the evidence to establish that that is that that mm. is what has happened. But, but, but theoretically, theoretically, that would be something because it's looking at a present factor. That, that indicates how you might do in the future. But I would just emphasize this, that you have to look at it in the round. So what you wouldn't do is just pull out one customer yeah. and say, oh, well, that, that customer hasn't. I mean, let's take an example of um, NIDEC. NIDEC is a good example, because NIDEC was not in any way, shape, or form in contemplation as at the 31st of December 2017. So if you then go to the 12th of October 2018, and you say, well, NIDEC doesn't look months, we would say, one, it's a few months, uh, two, it's only one out of a much bigger pipeline, and you haven't said anything about the overall pipeline, you've just looked at this one deal. And three, if you're comparing, if you do want to focus on that one particular, use the word prospect in a different sense, that one particular potential opportunity, and then you compare it with the account state, NIDEC didn't exist, that's only got better. And, and that point about the fact that these pros these um, individual opportunities come and go, or might have been realised in the time frame, and, and might have been built into the business, or might have been replaced with something else, they, they all really do go to support the broad point that you have to look at this in the round, and you, and you can't laser in on just one, one or two of these uh, possibilities. My Lord, that's all I propose to say in relation to that at this stage. Um, so we say, in conclusion on ground two, subject to any questions my Lords may have, that the judge was wrong as in, in his interpretation of the prospects warranty, and consequently in his findings that flow from that uh, in relation to quantum. 
and he's not just in relation to quantum, you say um, the basis on which he found breach was misconceived yes. and there is no alternative basis. Absolutely. And if the court is, is with me, there may be then a question of what remedy should be granted. And, and I'm really in the court's hands in relation to that as to what extent it's helpful to deal with that now or whether that's a matter to deal with once we have uh, your Lordship's judgment and, and uh, in relation to and, uh, nothing has been suggested about that this should be remitted um, certainly as I say there's no respondents notice saying you should look at this in some different way uh, but we could look at what the pleaded case is and I've alluded to that in my skeleton so that, <coughs> that, that just doesn't get off the ground and therefore this has nowhere to go we would say. I, I certainly think before the close of your submissions it would be helpful if you included in them submissions as to whether there should be a remittal or not, in, in the event of our accepting all of your points. I'm very grateful, my lord. I mean, I can I can flag now. My primary position is that the order should simply be set aside, subject to in substance set aside, subject to the variation to bring in the counterclaim and, of course, deal with consequential matters in, in a different way in the event that we were to succeed. Uh, but I will I'll come to that. Probably better to come to that after ground two, sorry, ground one, uh, ground, one. ground one, which is now issue two, uh, which is wh where I would like to start now, if I may. Uh, and this this is that the judge's approach to the prospects warranty uh, were not only wrong, but the product of a serious procedural irregularity and unjust. Uh, obviously, we recognise that uh, whether and to what extent this matters may depend on what the court finds on ground one, but it is a, a separate and freestanding ground. This was an approach that, in short, was not pleaded and argued on, on my side or, or the other side, and I understand that that fact is common ground. I understand that my learned friend's case broadly is it's close enough uh, and so that it's not unfair. And Ali and Dink is, is the main case my learned friend relies on, and so we'll look at that. Uh, but given that, given that that is the case being met, I'm afraid there's, there's nothing else to be done but, but to look through what, what was argued at the various points, what was there in the pleadings, which will be helpful perhaps also in the question of remedy as well, so it'll be uh, worthwhile from that perspective um, certainly as well. I, I propose first to look at the relevant law uh, and then the way the case that was presented, if I may. Uh, and my learned friend's skeleton Core bundle, page 276, sets out two propositions of law, which might be a useful place to start. <coughs> and the first one is, a statement of case should identify the issues and the extent of the dispute between the parties, making clear the general nature of the case being advanced, taking that from McPhillamy. And then second, it's commonplace in civil litigation for a judge to decide a case on a basis that neither party has explicitly pleaded, citing Ali and Dink, and saying that that's an approach adopted in practice by the Supreme Court in Sara and Hussein. So we'll look at Ali and Dink and we'll look at Sara and Hussein. That proposition only goes so far, we say, and it needs to be understood in its context. The first point on McPhillamy, again, it's, it's an authority that this court may have seen many times before in relation to the importance of pleadings. If the point being made is that uh, pleadings aren't important, or you don't have to make clear what your case is, or you don't have to set out the, the facts on which you rely to make good your case, then obviously we object to that. Is what has been said here wrong? Is that part of what is said in McPhillamy? Yes, but it, it's, not, it's not the whole picture. But I'm not sure how much it really assists to go to McPhillamy and look at it, exactly what's said there. My lord, my lady, what, what I might suggest, um, if I may, but perhaps by way of homework, is if, if I simply give a reference to the Charles Russell Speechley case, which we've cited at uh, authorities 19, page 380, paragraphs 55 to 59, there are a... Sorry, what was the page reference again? Yes, it's... Uh, no, tab 19, page 380. I don't think we've got the tabs. So the page, right, page see, numbers are more important. We haven't got tabs and we haven't got page numbers in the index. Does, does your lordship have book, are there bookmarks? No. There are no bookmarks in the, Well, I apologise for no bookmarks in the court's bundle. Anyway, anyway so, so we've got... So what are we looking got, for? <laughs> in Charles Russell's speech, page 380. 380. And 
from paragraph 55 down to paragraph 59. <coughs> a suite of citations about how important he is, how important it is to make one's case clear and clean to all the relevant facts, uh, etc., because that has a big impact on how people run their cases at trial uh, and so on. All, I'm sure, very familiar stuff. I could actually invite the court to read it now if you prefer. That probably is all I need to say in response to McPhillamy. In short, I don't understand how McPhillamy takes matters forward here in relation to the issue of whether the judge was entitled to fine for the claimants on a case that neither party had pleaded or argued. Melinda Friend's second proposition on its face is more on point, the commonplace of the courts to decide a case on an unpleaded basis point. We say as to that, certainly, it happens sometimes, and it's not necessarily unjust, it all depends on the facts. Conversely, no doubt, I'm sure my learned friend would not say that the court is free to decide whatever it thinks fit in any case, regardless of what is pleaded or argued, or whether a point is raised by the court with counsel that the court has come up with itself before it then proceeds to make a decision on that point. I'm sure he wouldn't say that. It's rather more nuanced. I propose to look at the case the two cases that Melinda Friend has cited and, and, and some others, probably not sensible, I suggest, for this court, probably not possible to lay down any hard and fast rules about when this can and can't be done. But that's part of what your lordships, your ladyships' ex experience is for in, in doing this job. You have to make judgments about that sometimes. I, I, and, and judges will, will be presented with infinitely different cases and have to do that. But what we say broadly emerges are four propositions. The first of these, and I'm not, I'm not reading from any particular case, these are, these are my summary. First, the key guiding principles are A, whether taking a course not pursued by the parties risks causing injustice. B, the fact that we have an adversarial system of justice rather than um, an inquisitorial one. Point two, we say that means that in general, the court should not go beyond the parameters of a case that has been pleaded or argued without objection, without first giving the parties an opportunity to address and decide whether to adopt such an approach. I'll, I'll read that again. That means that in general, the court should not go beyond the parameters of a case that has been pleaded or argued without objection, without first giving the parties an opportunity to address and decide whether to adopt such an approach. that does not prevent the court from reaching what are no more than intermediate conclusions based on parts of the pleaded cases and evidence presented on each side. Even though they do not reflect one or other party's case. That's the Ali and Bink point. And that is indeed commonplace and necessary. So that does not prevent the court from reaching what are no more than intermediate conclusions based on parts of the pleaded cases and the evidence presented, even though they do not reflect one or other party's case. We accept that's commonplace and necessary. Point four. There may be greater freedom for the court to take its own course in relation to issues of pure interpretation, which are matters of law, where those raise no real or new issue as to the application to the facts of the case. But, and this is still on the 
or <coughs> even in such cases, it will often be appropriate to raise any substantial issue with the parties so that they have a fair opportunity to address it with the court. Both as to interpretation and any implications it may have. The court may think it's a simple point of law that, that it, it can deal with and doesn't have any factual impact, but the parties might actually have something that would be of assistance to say on that if it were raised. As I say, I propose to focus on my submissions on the cases which are most directly applicable, which are those where the judge has come up with something him or herself and see what the courts have done about that. So the, the first case to look at is Al-Madeni, then Ali and Dink, all of them are the same. Al-Madeni is at Authorities, page 54. Decision of Lord Justice Dyson, as he then was. Uh, ask the court please to read paragraph 2 on page 55. Sets out the background. After that, please go to page 57, paragraph 8. The defendant appealed against the finding of liability, and this is Lord Justice Dyson at 8 going into what happened at trial. Uh, and we can just read the start of it there. In the course of her opening, Miss Harmer, who appeared as the claimant today and as she has done today, made it clear that her case was that the reel had fallen because it had been wrongly placed on the machine by Mr. Brake. And the defendant's case was that the claimant herself had placed the reel on the impede conveyor to the machine. Paragraph 9 sets out a quote from Defendant's counsel, Mr. Nolan's submissions, stating that the issue for the court was whether Mr. Brake put the reel there, as alleged. But then at 10, we have recorded an intervention from the judge with Mr. Nolan, saying there is another possibility, is there not? Apart from the claimant being responsible for it. And then at the end of that first paragraph, there are also four other candidates in the frame, are there not? And Mr. Nolan says, no, and in short he says no because that wasn't the pleaded case, that it was one of those other people. They might be in the frame in the sense that they were there, but they're not in the frame in terms of the allegations made. Parrot 11, Lord Justice Dyson says it will be convenient to refer to the judge's alternative suggestion as the third man theory. It is of some significance that Ms. Harmer did not take up the third man theory and did not suggest that Mr. Nolan had not accurately summarised the issue that the judge Side. Paragraph 12, the final sentence. No witness was asked whether any of these other employees might have been responsible for placing the offending reel on the spindle or another part of the machine. Paragraph 13 then deals with the final submissions. The judge indicated to Mr. Nolan that he would take a lot of persuading that either party was correct as to how the reel came to be in position uh, that it was in when it fell off gave the provisional view. Paragraph 16 shows us Mr. Nolan's response. He says, what I'm saying is, if the claimant says adamantly, this is how my accident happened, that claim is rejected. Where then, in the absence of any alternative case, it's not permissible to say we can speculate some other way in which the claimant could make the claim. She either has a factual case that she can establish, or she does not. Paragraph 18, then, uh, in her closing submissions, Ms. Harmer seems to have adopted the third man theory as an alternative to her primary case. Mr. Brake was responsible. She also raised it to a Lockwood case. Paragraph 19, I am in no doubt that the particulars of claim did not plead the third man theory. Then, paragraph 20, the court will not be shot at the top of page 60. The judge adopted the third man theory. In Judgment. <coughs> a critical passage then starts at paragraph 21, and we would invite, and it's down to 26, but to start with, we'd invite the court please to read 21.
So we can see there we say two, key, two of the key principles are identified. We have an adversarial system in which the issues to be decided are those raised and pursued by the parties. And as part of that, the parties must clearly identify the issues so that each has the opportunity of responding to the other. We can also take from that that judges can propose other ways to put the case or even encourage it. If the parties don't take it up, that's for them. It's critical, though, that the judge gives the parties the chance. Why? I suppose so they can decide whether they want to pursue it, because they might have tactical reasons. Take this, that, or the other point. And also because if they know the point's in the frame, they can say whether they can fairly deal with it, and if they can, they can deal with it. I would invite the court then please to read 22 in the citation from Loveridge, which picks up McPhilomy and emphasizes the importance of pleadings. We say that underscores the importance of pleadings. Sometimes no pleading point is taken, in which case the matter can proceed. That wasn't this case. We made very clear that we said we thought the case was the one on the pleadings and that was it. But the parties are entitled to object. If potential prejudice arises, then the answer is to consider whether to allow an amendment. So that paragraph is really dealing with the position where the party wants to adopt a position different from the pleaded case. It, it is very clear. But it, the, the underlying principles are somewhat similar, of course, because it's all about you had a fair opportunity to deal with things. And fundamentally, is that what has been <coughs> alleged and run for the duration of the case? And in that case, Judge Catlin, who I appeared in front of a lot, a long time ago, used to work, I can picture him saying all this. He raised the point right at the outset. He did. Even when the judge raised it, it was found to be unfair. We are very much a for to your right, my lord, because, as I say, rabbit out of a hat in the judgment in this case. Raised, but not taken up. And not put yes. to the witnesses, etc. Not put to the witnesses, and the evidence was not before the court. Yes. I mean, that is the sort of tension in this. I know you're coming on to the later paragraphs. How far do you just say, look, it's not in the pleadings? How far do you look further to see what unfairness might result because the witnesses haven't been asked about it or whatever. Yes. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure looking on, you get both ideas there, don't you? Yes, I mean, th those, those are both important points. I mean, we, we, there's a, there's a, there are cases, as we will see, where the court has said, the court has a discretion to allow parties to depart from their pleading case with, without requiring an amendment. Um, but then it's also said that it's always good practice to have an amendment. And perhaps th therein lies the answer to my Lord's question, because if you, if you have a pleading amendment, then there are well-known factors that one applies in deciding whether or not to allow that amendment, which take in points about lateness, prejudice, mucking around, so on and so forth. Not just about have you had witnesses and so on, but simply mucking around and chopping and changing at the last minute is itself a relevant factor. Is there a difference between, the, between um, whether the point raised by the judge is, is in support of the claim or, uh, or not? Here the judge found liability established on the basis of an unpleaded point. Yes. That's the same. Which is what happened here. Exa yes, exactly. I was going to say that's the same in both cases, I believe. Uh, yeah. Would it make a difference if the judge found in favour of the defendant on an unpleaded point? Um, I expect Mr. Warwick would say that it, it wouldn't, um, and he would feel similarly aggrieved if things were the other way around. Uh, my lord, we should go next to 23 to 25. Invite the court simply to read that for itself, please. 22 to 25. Sorry, but have we, if we've already read, we've already read 22. Two, mm -hmm. to 23 to 
25 is sort of make what I was groping towards, doesn't it? Well, it's the, the judge. If if the judge had taken the third man theory into account, the the, the, the outcome was to dismiss the case because it hadn't been pleaded. Yes. Quite so. If, if 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 the pleaded claim was not true. established. Yes. Then he should have dismissed the claim. Yeah. I mean, the points made in 23, there was an espousal of it in closing, but that was too late. A party should be given the opportunity to decide whether to take the point. 24 talks about, as Lord or Justice Neary was saying, whether it was picked up with the witnesses and yeah. the element of procedural unfairness in that particular regard. And then 25, we have what uh, our Lord or Justice Baker has uh, said about what, what should have happened in that case, given the pleaded case. And, and Lord Justice Dyson then says, by making findings for which the claimant was not contending, the judge crossed the line from an adversarial to an inquisitorial system. It wasn't a case pleaded, adopted at the right time, or any of those things. And if it had been, it was inquisitorial because it hadn't been adopted. If it had been, if there had been an attempt to adopt it, one would have considered, uh, is it appropriate to allow amendments to uh, justify, underpin the adoption? Uh, is it uh, too late? Is there prejudice? Have I heard the right evidence? And all those things. Exactly. But it's all just rolled up and steamrolled on. Precisely. The next port of call is Allium Dink, as cited by my learned friend for the, the second proposition we saw earlier. It deals with what counts as crossing the line. But page 392 of the authority of Bond Law. Starts at 391, and the judgment itself, the text starts at 393, which is more useful. Paragraph 2, please, on 393. This is Lord Justice Burse. And the response at paragraph three. through that, that case involved the transfer by Mr. Ali to Mr. Dink of two properties. Mr. Ali said that there was an oral agreement that Mr. Dink would pay him 1.35 million for those and discharge a charge on one of the properties. That's a paragraph 9, if you want it for your Lordship's Lordship's note. Uh, Mr. Ali then sued for that money, the price, he said. Mr. Dink said there was no such agreement. Rather, the properties were a gift, he said. But he did say there was a plan by which he would raise finance against the properties and provide that to Mr. Ali. Uh, he then raised finance but failed to transfer it. If we pick up at 15, this is the court's court of appeal or justice versus analysis. He says the judge rejected the key parts of each party's case but made certain findings of fact based on what was before. So we see there at point number one, it wasn't a gift, binding and honour only. Point two, it wasn't a sale either. Nevertheless, point three, it was an arrangement whereby the property was to be transferred and Mr. Dink was to pay him some money. Point five, neither party had made out its case as expressly advanced. Six, on the evidence both parties had in mind as part of their arrangement that the properties would need to be used to provide security for the funds that needed to be raised by the first defendant to pay the claimant. The court might want to read six there. Then at seven, judge gave her reasons for her conclusion and this was an 
explicit element of Mr. Dink's version of events and implicit in Mr. Alley's version of events, that he expected the property to be used to raise security, but not the full purchase price of 1.35 million. Paragraph 16 says that the judge went on to find it was the clear intention of both parties, mutually understood, that the properties would be transferred by Mr. Alley to Mr. Dink, would used, be used exclusively for raising funds, which were to be transferred on the basis of a quiz close trust. And no one argued that the, paragraph 18, no one argued that the elements of a quiz close trust were not made out if those were indeed the facts. The court discusses the law from 19 down to 25. We've seen Alma Denny already at 19, so I won't repeat that. Paragraph 21 is the Supreme Court decision in Thamesbury's, which just underlines the importance of ours being an adversarial system. There's then a citation from Satyam. I invite the court please to read paragraphs 22 and 23 to themselves. Satyam is in the bundle, but it's simpler just to take this extract and we don't have to go there. I'll do that. Great, thank you. I would just emphasize from that at the end of paragraph 23, i.e. citing 35 from Satyam, that the threshold, it says there at the end, where a departure from the pleaded case might cause prejudice. That's a low threshold. Sorry. Sorry, this is at the end of, it's just above 24. Yep. In Alley and Dink. I see, yes. And in the Charles Russell Speechley case, Mr. Justice Cotter accepted that that was the right threshold. I'm sorry, did you want us to read 24 as well? Yes, please. Yep. Probably don't need to read the part that simply recites Alma Denny, so perhaps in 24 read down to where it says Alma Denny and then pick up at 38 within the citation. Yes. appropriate as well to read 25 and the key point in 25 is Lord Justice Burst emphasises the importance of prejudice and pragmatism uh, in the system. Obviously as we've been discussing already that, that's a key point. Uh, it's, it's, only, it's only one element and the nature of prejudice is perhaps best explored through the lens of a C.P. Gallifer type set of factors if someone makes an application to amend. I don't, suggest, don't imagine that this is intended to cut across that but I'd invite the court to read 25 please. And in effect 25 is it in a nutshell? M Milady, yes. As long as we say you understand prejudice 
broadly, and this isn't cutting across the suite of factors that one would take into account as extrapolated in, in the case law on late amendments. Twenty six, then, in terms of approach, Lord Justice Burst says to decide this appeal, the test will be to identify what case or cases the parties were advancing, compare that with the decision the judge made, and identify what prejudice, if any, may have been caused to the defendants, uh, which, of course, is what we're going to do in, in relation to our case shortly. At 27, we've then got the assessment. And if we go to the middle of that paragraph, there's a sentence that starts, one of Mr. Ali's repeated allegations on his primary case was that the properties were now held on resulting or constructive trust by the first defendant absolutely for him, and the same allegation that the properties were now held on trust was advanced as part of the alternative case if, which was denied, the defendant's version was accepted. So that it's, it's not like the trust point was something that the judge came up with. That was very much there on the pleading. And then 29 says, focusing on the pleadings, summarize what the judge's conclusions were at A to D, and then says this, these, A to D, were all matters which were either undisputed or were part of one or other party's pleaded case, or both. In reaching these conclusions, the judge was also rejecting distinct parts of each party's case as she was entitled to do. It explains which bits were being rejected. Paragraph 30, in other words, the judge's conclusions are composed entirely of the acceptance or rejection of factual assertions which were pleaded, although the re-amended particulars did not explicitly spell out the point that the arrangement was not a gift or binding in honour only. That was necessarily implicit in Mr. Ali's case. So this case is a long way from Almadeni and Satya, and where the judge found facts which are outside the ambit of Ali's alleged pleaded case. And then they go through cross-examination, prejudice, And then at 34, the summary there, standing back, it's fair to note that the judge's conclusion does amount to a particular intermediate combination of the various factual assertions made in the both parties' cases. And the combination itself is one that neither party had expressly pleaded. However, that is commonplace in civil litigation. It tends to be infinitely variable the circumstances in which that may arise. Um, in a to introduce a slightly different uh, area of the law. In the, in the family jurisdiction, which you appreciate, I, I sit in most frequently, where we don't have pleading, and there's a quasi inquisitorial system. Nonetheless, it often arises that complaints are made if a, if a judge goes beyond what is the case put, picked up in a care proceeding. And in one case, the phrase adopted is it's all right if the judge remains within the known parameters of the case. So that's the phrase which Lord Justice Snowden introduced. <laughs> Which I've adopted. That's sort of what we're talking about here, is the known parameters of the case. Yes, my lord. I mean, if one looks at McPhillamy, for example, yeah. um, that is one of the words that Lord Justice Wolf, sorry, Lord, lord Wolf, as he was at that stage, uh, said, pleading set the parameters of the case. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, the parameters of the case will generally be defined by the pleadings which require you in the civil litigation, uh, non family context, commercial litigation yeah. context, to define. Of course all of the facts upon which you rely, concisely, but still to identify them. Sometimes other facts will arise in the process. That sometimes happens in relation to quantum, for example, where you have expert reports and, and so on. Uh, or it might be that someone takes a point and nobody objects. That, would then, that then comes into the parameters of the case, because someone has said, clearly, I'm taking this point, and the other side has said, fine, we'll let that slide. There's no point taking that, because you get permission to amend. Or, they have their own tactical reasons. Uh, so, yes, but still we say the parameters are generally set by the pleadings, or you have to find some other way where you it don't, you, come in. There's no tension or, 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 or um, development in what Lord Justice Burr says here, compared to what Lord Justice David Richards to see more said in the earlier case. I look, I look, I mean, we would say that they're emphasising different points, but really they, all of these have to be taken into account. And not, we would say, any kind of fundamental shift if one understands prejudice in the broad sense that it is understood when one looks at applications to amend. The final case I wanted to look at on this topic is Sarah and Hussain that Malone and Friends have cited, which is at 
this is his skeleton is the best place to go. Page two seven six. If you study the back closely, Mr. Lowe, you'll see that it's a case with which I had some familiarity. <laughs> I, may, I may have missed that. I apologise. Uh, check out actually what happened, Mr. Lowe. <laughs> <laughs> in in, in Sarah's saying, my little friend has summarised what happened very helpfully for all of us uh, in the skeleton argument of Sarah. At page 276, and it's the paragraph at the top, 27 sub 5. summary, I'm not sure if we actually need to go to the Sarah Hussein case itself. There's no question that the Supreme Court, as far as I can see, did come up with uh, its own interpretation. Uh, but the immediate question I had when I read this in the Learner Friends Skeleton argument was, surely the Supreme Court didn't just produce that like a rabbit out of the hat in its judgment. I, mean, I, I, I have had the pleasure of losing on an unpleaded point in the Supreme Court myself, but to be fair to Lord Reid and the others on the panel at the time, they gave us an opportunity to make submissions on this particular point. It was a short point of construction. It was a prisoner's case, poor gas. And in the end, it, it, what we, we lost on, on that point. It was determinative against us, but we, we had a fair crack of the whip to deal with it. And it didn't affect all of, any factual points or require the application of those. So I watched Sarah Hussein on the Supreme Court website, like not, every, <laughs> not, every, not every minute of it. I don't know whether my Lord's done that. I, I haven't actually. It depends, how, how, it depends how interested my Lord is in seeing how it all played out. But uh, my suspicion was right. Uh, in, in fact, this, this alternative approach features extensively. So in the morning session at 17 minutes and 40 seconds, <laughs> if anyone wants to go away and look at this, We'll see Lord Kitchen raised with the Appellants Council a potential alternative approach. Um, that approach was then extensively canvassed with the <coughs> Respondent's Advocate in the afternoon session. That's perhaps most clear in Lord Hodge's questions at 13 minutes into the afternoon session, but actually that's quite a long stint that starts at eight minutes in. But my lords can, and my lady can tell that I, I had some fun preparing <laughs> for this. Uh, and then in I reply, feel fun might not be quite the right word, Mr. Lowe. Some education, anyway. Uh, and in reply, we see that the appellant advocate adopt this approach uh, at one hour forty-eight minutes, and Lord Hodge engaged with her on that. So, I expect it did not come as a shock to anyone when it was in the judgment. One can see that Lord Briggs dissenting bridle that is. He doesn't, that's, not, that's not his reason for dissenting, though, is it? It's not his reason for dissenting. He, he simply thinks that one, one it's wrong. To, he just simply thinks it's wrong, exactly. But, but he thinks it's not open on the contract as properly interpreted. It's unfortunate that you have to choose a, an option that doesn't quite seem to be the right thing to do on the merits, but that's what the contract says. Uh, and he does say it's an imaginative creation, etc. But that's more targeted as it being wrong. The grave is good and pure. Thank you. He didn't. We got his reference of his. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm afraid that's not in the bundle. Yes, in all words. So we we entirely accept, based on all of that, that sometimes a court can fairly decide a case on the basis of a point not pursued or raised by the parties, because we see that discussed in Alma Denny, Ali and Dink. Uh, we saw in the citation from Satyam and Ali and Dink, the court has the power to allow a departure from a pleaded case. So amendment is not always required, but generally good practice reasons we've already been through, because it frames the issue, make sure it's clear, you know exactly what you're responding to, it's pithily put down, and then only on the basis of that can you go off and say definitively, well, I would need this evidence or that evidence or the other to respond to that, this is how it mucks me about and so on. 
it's perhaps not necessary when no point is taken to have an amendment, uh, or perhaps when the issue is just one of legal interpretation. As it happens, for example, in the Court of Appeal, that people take new points. I'm, I'm accused, and I accept I am doing that on my ground three today. There's been no amendment to the pleading to do that. It's in my appeal notice, which fulfills that role, and we say there's a very good reason why I'm taking a new point, but it does happen. Sometimes, in fact, you can be required to amend in the Court of Appeal. Sometimes not. It, it, it depends. But what is unfair is where a new point or approach not found in the pleadings or arguments, or parts of either side's cases where you can make an intermediate finding, emerge at the risk of overusing the expression as a rabbit out of a hat in the judgment. That's the first that we see of it. It's not being canvassed by or with the parties, especially where there might cross prejudice, that's a problem. So my Lord, then let's look at the case that was presented, if I may, and we'll start with the we'll look at the pleadings, then openings, and then closings, if I may. Start with the particulars of claim, which is at core, page 95. Paragraph 8 there. Warranty 19 is the prospect warranty. Paragraph 8 sets out that certain documents were supplied by the defendants to the claimants, uh, which include the, the pipeline documents and the May forecast. Uh, 9 says that in breaches of warranty 19, specifically 19.1.2, 10 we can skip because it relates to turnover. 11 and 12 relate to the prospect. I would invite the court, please, to read those. So the case is that at 11 is that it is as the definition of prospect which we've covered. And then we've got since the account state there's been a material adverse change in turnover and prospects not properly reflected in those documents. And we say that then doesn't say, and here's how that works, and here's how we say that was a change, etc. And we say it's extraneous, or, or, or at, at best, and really generously, it's simply saying this feeds in shows you why on the facts we say the position as at the 12th of October 2018 should be taken to be X rather than Y, but as a freestanding claim it, it can't be anything but a, a breach of the prospect because of the nature of that warrant. <laughs> at 12 is the critical paragraph because that says what the material adverse change was, i.e. had the correct position been represented, consulting services revenue would have been X. In other words, as I understand it, they're saying consulting services revenue for 2018 as assessed to the relevant date should have been X, 3.553 million. That represents a decrease from the consulting services revenue in 2017. That, so this represents a material adverse change in turnover and prospects. Or do we say that that's both turnover and prospects? And you might suggest much sense to call it, but we'll, we'll come to that later. So the this proceeds, it focuses on consulting services revenue. It does exclusively. Exclusively. And if we take the two dates approach, um, it says as at the first date we use consulting services revenue for 2017. So if that's to be reconciled with prospects, I suppose there has to be an idea that you would expect consulting services revenue to be the same in 2018 as it would have been in 2017. Yes, that, that doesn't feature anywhere. I mean, we, we say that that is a problem with the case, is that there's no properly pleaded statement of what the prospects are. There's a, there's a reference to what turnover was in another year, but that isn't, <coughs> that isn't the prospect. And, and then that's to be compared with consulting services revenue for 2018. 
So we say, to foreshadow where we're going with this, we say once you interpret the clause properly and realise what the comparison is that you should be doing, this doesn't work as a claim because you haven't identified what the prospects were, you've just told us what the turnover was in 2017 uh, as at the account date, and you haven't told us, uh, you haven't set out facts which would amount to a breach because the fact that turnover is anticipated to be lower for the last two and a half months of 2018 does not constitute a mere material adverse change in prospects because it's simply obviously too short of a time frame over which to be assessed. The point on prospects is picked up again at 37 and 38. So if we, if we run we run through the pleading, what we see then is warranty 20, and you do this flicking through it. There's then a whole list of inaccuracies and discrepancies in the May forecast set out in relation to each of the four projects, which says, instead of saying X, you should have said Y, which then gives broadly the figure that the, the judge came up with and, and the claims expert came up with as to what that forecast should have looked like if it had been done, the claims were done properly. 37 and 38 sums up again invite the court to read that. It starts at the bottom of 101. Reiterating essentially the same, the same case. And my learned friend uh, highlighted 30, uh, 37, 38 in, in his oral opening, so I, it's right that I draw attention to that here because, quite right, there is a reference to prospects there, but it's, it's the same comparison of the turnover of the three different estates that we say uh, is a non sequitur in terms of breach. Nothing there. As my lords and my lady would have seen, about a reasonable person's view of the prospects based on information passing between the parties as at the 12th of October 2018, or based on common frank disclosure as at the 12th of October 2018. That's the particulars of claim subject to just looking at the loss, which is at page 105 and paragraph 49. Amount claimed is 8.85 million, calculated based on an enterprise value of 9,605 million, minus an adjusted enterprise value of 9,600. That was taken from an expert report, a draft expert report that Mr. Deal and the claimant expert had produced, but what wasn't provided with this, we just that came out in the course of trial. That work had all been done in the background, which is how they were able to put this down, but it's an omnibus figure of loss. And it reflects the notice which they gave before this, which set an omnibus figure of loss. I mean, the pleading actually is essentially the same terms as the notice. It, it is, my lord. Because of the unusual archaeology in this, this case, which we came out to trial, one, one looks at the two side by side, and then one looks at Mr. Diemann's expert report. And one thinks, my goodness, has this expert just copied out the pleadings into his expert report? That would be extraordinary. It wasn't, it wasn't that, but it's the other way around, which is similarly extraordinary, that the expert had essentially put together what became the pleading when one took out various bits of it and, and, and dropped them down. It became the notice first, and then it became the pleading. So it shows the expert had been over everything, had, had done, done the homework, uh, and comes in on ground three and what's reasonably practicable. You have an expert who's done all this work, why couldn't you have just quantified uh, your prospects? But we'll, we'll come to that. There's been no suggestion in terms of the defence that we presented 
any case based on a reasonable person, but perhaps we should look at it briefly anyway. Core 7118. Pick up the first 10.2. Please go on to power 13.1, which is over on 119, bottom of 119. 13.1 deals with the definition of prospects, which we've already discussed, but that's the pleading on it. Pipelines comprise or represented the prospects at all or in any event of the relevant date. They're produced in the middle of the year, so they wouldn't be telling you about the relevant date for the purposes of 19.1.2. 14 14 oh, sorry, start with 14.5.1. In fact, I invite the court simply to read 14.5 as a whole. before. 
forward to keep Harris at 58. I mean, the complication in, in pleading terms or in terms of what any order would do is that on the face of it, you have to have shares issued to you rather than having a sum of money. We sought specific performance uh, in respect of getting the shares. Now, it, it might be that this would be something the parties would have to discuss, that everyone would be happier if that was done in cash rather than shares. I, I don't know, but I fully accept that our pleading case is specific performance, so we'd have to formulate an order requiring the steps under the contract to be taken for us to get our shares as it stands. Um, and just staying on this tangent for one moment, um, holding the sold the benefit of this contract to share case. Uh, the, yes. the first claimant is sold. There's been an assignment. Has yes. assigned the benefit yes. of the contract to share case, the second claimant. Yes. Um, your entitlement contractually would be to shares in the first claimant. It would. And, and it's, is it's, the first claimant still a substantial company, or uh, uh, has everything gone to the second claimant? Or do we not want My understanding that? is that all that has been transferred to the second is this claimant is, is cotton. Yes, I see. Uh, but I'll be, I'll be correct if I'm wrong about that, and my learned friend can, can talk about the current standing of the, of the first claimant. Um, we're coming to one o'clock. Is it convenient just to look at the reply and defence account claim? Yes, no, if that's not the first thing. Uh, it's page 152. on the TFL point, actually, rather than on material adverse change. That's the only paragraph to which I was going to go in, in, in the reply. Obviously, you can't bring a claim in your reply, so even, even if there were a claim smuggled in here, that, that wouldn't do. But uh, As a matter of fact, I just wonder, if you go back to 37 and 41. The paragraphs in the reply. Paragraphs 37 and 41. In the reply. In the reply. <coughs> um, so, warranty 90.1.2 is concerned with prospects. Yep. So, uh, prospects were vital to the first claimant so on, and then 41, the word prospects is a reference to the defendant's then present day assessment of the opportunities that were listed. Some of the prospects have been secured and were ongoing, and so on. Uh, on the face of it, this is nothing to do with EBITDA. Nothing to do with EBITDA, and, and also it, it looks an awful lot like a misrepresentation claim rather than anything to do with what the prospects were at any given time. It's all about what well, we relied on this. We relied upon documents that you gave us. It's, it's so vague as to be meaningless. My lord, if that's a convenient moment. Yeah. Uh, so, two o'clock.